Thanks for the uh, gracious uh, introduction, Dr. Rodell, and um, uh, thanks for all of you for your abbreviated uh, coffee break. Um, I know it was short. Today, um, I'd like to talk about a molecule that uh, actually we've grown old together. Um, when I started dairy practice in 1978, that happened to be the same year that flu Nixon was launched. So we were both released at the same time, I guess you could say. So um, unlike, uh, unlike me, though, this product has been uh, reconstituted, refurbished, rejuvenated into something I think um, will have very positive benefits both in uh, cattle welfare and the welfare of the farm, farm worker, the, the people that you serve every day. So, um, so we'll, we'll move ahead here. One of the things that uh, I never really reckoned with while I was in veterinary school, or certainly when I was thinking about becoming a veterinarian, was the fact that actually substantial part of your day is spent inflicting pain on animals. I mean, however you want to couch it, things like dehorning and castration and delivering calves and, you know, re re reducing prolapse uteruses, all those things are painful procedures. And 40 years ago, um, the standard of practice, I would say all across the world, left something to be desired and I really uh, applaud the veterinary profession for kind of leading from behind 40 years ago to actually taking leadership role in, in animal welfare. And I also wanna, anybody that's still reticent about animal welfare, I think one of the things you should consider is that it's nothing new and it shouldn't be political or anything like that. I happen to see this sign uh, on a, castle livery wall where they kept their horses and you know it's it's 200 and over 250 years old and it said a merciful man is merciful to his beast so animal welfare is not a new concept and um, it's definitely something that that I think our profession uh, is paying a lot of attention to and a lot of good research and I would put this this um, molecule right up there so today what I'd like to talk about specifically in the few minutes I'm given is uh, lameness and pain and then the mitigation of that pain um, in two different studies uh, that, that were done, uh, one for the European launch a couple years prior and then um, uh, the, the, the studies that were done in the U.S. that al allowed us to uh, be allowed a, a, a pain claim, the first uh, uh, FDA allowed pain claim in food animals. So these studies were done across the pond, but it's a different pond than we are on, but uh, it's no less a pond. So why foot rot? One of the, one of the reasons that um, in the U.S. We've, we um, used foot rot as, as, a, as a metric of pain is simply because it was a very repeatable disease model. So we could get 100% lameness by injecting um, uh, fusarium in, into an animal's foot and that have a very good model for determining if, if our product actually mitigated some of that pain and, and I'll show you how, how this was done. So basically, we trained cattle to, to we trained cattle to um, uh, walk on a pressure mat, so got them used to their surroundings, <clears throat> and then, um, and I'll show you the um, timeline in a second, but basically injected them then with uh, fusarium necrophorum. We did this study in two different sites. One, it was an FDA requirement. The second, though, is these sites, U.S. Uh, is a very uh, large geographical area with many uh, climates, and so we did one uh, site with warm climate and one in a more cold climate just to see if it affected uh, clinical efficacy because this is an external, uh, external transdermal uh, uh, poron. So 
This just shows you a little illustration of how we determined um, objectively rather than just using locomotion scoring. So we did standard locomotion scoring like was done in the European study, which I'll show you in a minute. But we also used a pressure mat, which is not unlike Dr. Scholl's when you would go in and see if you were a pronator or supernator and get the proper running shoes. It basically measures contact area of the hoof and then also kilograms uh, of force on each foot as the animal walk, walks across this mat. And there's a picture of the mat as well. And uh, the outcome measurement down below, which is then uh, uh, put into a computer program for analysis. So basically the study design is this. Um, you inject them with the, the pathogen and 48 hours later, these, these animals, which there were 15 in a group for each site, so 30 steers, about five or 600 pounds, uh, were randomized into two groups at both of these sites. So 60 steers in total. Waited 48 hours. Um, every one of those animals was lame. They, they did it in the right front foot and every animal was lame. And so basically randomized into two groups prior poured with um, trans, transdermal flunixin, uh, one group and the other group, nothing. And, and so that was your baseline. And then six hours later, because that was a protocol that FDA ap approved, it was um, where the maximum plasma concentration of, of the drug is. And, and then uh, looked at the differences between uh, the controls and the treatments. So for site one, this was the more warm, um, like Tokyo was a couple days ago. This, this um, and, and you can see on the left, the kilograms of force. Um, the control group actually continued to get more lame. So that's why you can get a negative kilograms of force. Basically that's a negative from the baseline. And then you can see 43 kilograms per animal um, more weight put on um, uh, as they walked across the pressure mat, and the contact area increased uh, by the same by the same margin, basically. So very much increased. They were they were putting their foot down. They were feeling better. Site two had very similar um, uh, very similar uh, statistics, basically showing um, that ambient temperature did, did not uh, adversely affect the clinical uh, efficacy of this, of this product. Um, yeah, this just shows the st statistics. One of the interesting things was we also used uh, locomotion scoring. We used locomotion scoring in, um, which has never been an accepted model for FDA, especially for pain, because it is subjective. And there was a, a bigger variation in, uh, although there was a, still a huge statistical difference between treatments and controls, there was quite um, a, a bit of difference between the two sites as, because there were two different scores um, than there was with the objective pressure mat where you saw almost exactly the same results. So I, I thought that was interesting and maybe buttress, buttress the fact that FDA requires an objective measurement and this pressure mat seemed to fill the bill. Uh, the EU study was uh, more, uh, uh, a little different in that it used naturally occurring lameness in cattle in dairy herds and uh, there were eight different commercial dairy herds across Europe that were used with eight different um, investigators. Uh, 72 animals total, I believe, in, the, in that study. And basically, they did use the locomotion scoring, the, the Sprecher locomotion scoring. They also used a lesion scoring system, which um, basically looked at both the size of the lesion and the amount of swelling uh, in an animal. They disallowed any animal that had more than one leg lameness. It, it only could be one, one leg. And, and basically, it was a, uh, in, the, in the EU, there's a huge difference, too, in that any animal that was diagnosed lame had to have, uh, for their animal use uh, and care committees, 
had to have uh, an antibiotic given at the same time. So basically, your control group was an antibiotic called Cobactin, and your treatment group was uh, transdermal flunixin and Cobactin. So even though it, um, it may say uh, negative, and th this just shows you it's 3.3 milligrams per kilogram, which was the same uh, poron that we used in, in our study in the States. And of course, a, a sham red dye so that they were poured with something. And um, uh, so by the time, I think by the time th they got the results, there were uh, 65 uh, animals that were, that were scored in this study. And you can see the timeline below, but basically the, the treatment was initial treatment with Cobactin and Banamine, and then they were measured six hours, 24, 48, and 72 hours later. And, and, the, um, and the Cobactin was given daily, but only one dose of transdermal flunixin. <clears throat> This, is, this graph is a little uh, busy. Maybe I can help with a little, little bit here, if I can find the. Basically what you're looking at is severity of lameness. So this, um, this shows you at day zero where uh, you have a lot of um, uh, very lame animals. And the, the ones that had, so the Cobactin group by itself, which below it says over there it says negative control, but really it's not a it's not a classical negative control because it is cobactin, and obviously as you know many of the they characterize the feet lesions as abscesses, interdigital dermatitis, foot rot. Um, I think were the three primary ones. So antibiotics by itself um, will start to improve. But the difference between the antibiotics alone and antibiotics and transdermal um, uh, flunixin on locomotion scoring was significantly different. And it was significant also at 24 hours. And then at 48 and 72 hours, they started to, they were still numerically different, but they started to come together because now you had three days of antibiotics and you, you, you weren't technically reducing the pain, but once you get rid of a disease, the pain goes away. So it uh, it's, makes sense to me. So I would just conclude by saying that <clears throat> from our other talks this morning too, I mean, uh, they're even looking at un, you know, the pain associated with unassisted calving um, in the calf. And you know, I think about my children being born uh, many years ago, and I'm sure they were in pain too and got nothing, but uh, so, so it's very interesting. I think we're uh, certainly in an age, and, it, and it's not just brought about by consumers, but it's brought about by processors, it's brought about by social norms, it's brought about by generational distance from, from farming practices. Um, I think we have to be prepared to uh, to actually justify what we do and to mitigate the pain where we can. And I think that um, it's very obvious from this session that that's a preeminent concern in the raising of, of livestock and to have our social license to still have meat and milk to offer the public. So um, basically these two groups of studies I think show that uh, it, uh, Flunixin, uh, transdermal flunixin, is a very good uh, choice, and I think not only does it reduce pain in animals, but if you talk about the difference between giving an IV injection to an animal ver and the restraint that it takes and the talent that it takes, some one of our earlier speakers was talking about having a practice whereby the farmer could do it. Um, under a prescription of a veterinarian, it's very easy to pour something down uh, an animal's back and get the same results, and just as quickly, too. The absorption is very fast. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention and um, certainly would entertain any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.